Hi, today we are interviewing with someone who comes from a family with whom Suntur is as synonymous as politics is with Gandhi's and business is with Tata's family. Welcome Rahul Sharma. Oh, thank you I so much. didn't give any, your introduction because everybody knows you come from a family with whom Suntur, they not only innovated, ideated the Suntur, but makes it popular across the world also. So no, you first I would want, want to like to know, when did you find that you had a knack or a liking for the Sintur as an instrument? You know, it all started with when I was around 12 or 13, I used to uh, come back from school and try and play the harmonium and play some of the hymns. Uh, I was in a convent school and uh, I used to try and play those hymns on the harmonium. And uh, I used to just, you know, fiddle around with a little Casio keyboard and my interests were primarily trying to reproduce the sounds or the tunes that I had heard. And then it got to a point where I was trying to compose my little own music, you know. So my father noticed all that and uh, he introduced me to the Santur. And of course the Santur was constantly at home. I would listen to a lot of students learning from him and it was always there in the subconscious. Uh, you know, as such, but uh, to kind of get one-on-one -on -one with the Santur, that happened naturally through my father. And he thought probably there was a musical inclination happening and uh, that's the reason why he kind of guided me and uh, introduced a small little Santur on which I would sometimes start practicing and he would teach me. So it all began with that and the process had just begun and then it just got into more deeper and deeper and uh, took over my life in, in a way. Uh, Rahul, the point I uh, uh, just was trying to understand from you is that Sintur as an instrument did take some time to get it uh, recognized as a real classical instrument in a purest form of a sense if I would rather say it. So did you have any feeling that you should you would rather play some other instruments or for you, Sintur was the first and the last thing you wanted to do. See, that's a whole different uh, effort of a lifetime to popularize one instrument. That, the credit goes to my father for that. And uh, to do that was an impossible task, what he did. But he did it. And for me, uh, from my perspective, I really loved the tonal quality of the Sintur compared to any other instrument. I did love the piano as well. Uh, I did love composing my own tunes, but the Sintur sound was really beautiful, very um, soothing. Sometimes I would be studying and I would play the Santur uh, cassettes of uh, Santur, you know, of my father's and I would find it enhanced my concentration. At the same time, when you, when one wanted to calm down, you would just switch it on and it would just make me feel uh, pretty nice and serene. So I think that quality is, was definitely there in the instrument which was enhanced by my father. So I would say that the, if, if someone is a pioneer of an instrument and becomes the pioneer, then they need to understand the temperament of the instrument, which was done by uh, my father. So that just simplified a lot uh, for other people who were taking up the instrument in the future. You know? So if, if I'm a torchbearer of uh, his legacy, then I need to enhance that more. At the same time, add whatever I've been doing, which has been happening. It's been 20 years of performing on stage for me now. And uh, it's been an interesting journey with the Santu so far. Uh, yeah, we can understand it has been quite a fascinating journey for you and for the uh, listeners of the Santu itself. But you spoke about that Santu had certain temperament, which you liked. I mean, uh, could you please tell us our viewers, what is the basic temperament of the Sintur and how does it different, how do you differentiate it in temperamental manner with other instruments? See, the Sintur um, was a little folk known instrument and it was used in Sufiana Mosiki. So, the fact that this was just an accompanying instrument, not uh, a stage leader in that sense, not on that pedestal. So that, uh, the journey that you're talking about it was to establish that instrument into the mainstream and to have the critics uh, applaud it, 
have the critic's approval if that's required, if that means anything. So all those things took so many years and uh, the nature of the Santur was, I personally feel was at that point of time very much in the background. Like this is a background instrument, you know. If a singer is out there, then for some time you distract and then this instrument plays a little and that's it. It doesn't do that, anything more than that. So all those things changed when the Santur got the main stage, uh, when it got that pedestal, when it gained in popularity. Then obviously uh, people realize that there's more to it. You know, it's not just what it used to be. So that journey took a long time and my father did that introduced various different techniques on it, uh, introduced different styles, created the mean on it, which is there on other, uh, which was already there on other instruments like the sitar and sarod. So the santur has a different style of creating the uh, nuances of Indian classical music, which now the other instruments do not. We play certain particular patterns of uh, rhythmic movements which other instruments do not. Similarly, every instrument has its unique style, you know. So all those things, it's, it's an extremely deep uh, research, I would say. If you look into the past, how it progressed, what happened, and now what's happening, now with the fusion, now with the collaborations. The Santur, uh, for instance, a couple of years ago, uh, I collaborated with Kenny G, the Grammy Award winner. And we had the album on uh, number one on jazz billboard charts in the US. So that was a big high to have the Santur from a little known uh, place in India, from Jammu Kashmir, and then all the way to the US billboard charts. So all these things are part of the journey of the Santur, exploring the temperament of the Santur and still discovering more, what more possibilities are. So what you were saying, I mean, what I could sense is that Santur has come from being an instrument of background music to now a forefront music, forefront in instrument in its own self. Is See, it what? Yeah. By background, what I mean is as an accompanying. A accompaniment, instrument. exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. Now it's established as a. I mean, Not just now; it has been done at least 20, 15 years ago. Yeah. I would say more than that. More than, primarily by your father itself. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. No, I mean, uh, I just for all we, our viewers would li also like yeah. to I mean, know more about you as a person and your musical journey also. You started you playing with the music, I mean, uh, this playing the instrument at the age of 12 and then you performed what I was researching at the age of 22 rather. Yeah. yeah. So were you a bit reluctant or were you practicing or were you nervous in those 10 years period? I was not really nervous. It's like uh, when you're preparing for uh, any other profession, if you're doing CA, you have to go through the grind, right? If you're doing anything else, whatever work it is, it's a preparation. Similarly, when you're uh, going out there to perform on stage, there's a certain procedure. You have to get used to the traveling because as musicians, we travel a lot. Um, so. You have to get used to the fact that you step down from a flight, go up on stage, perform, catch a flight the next day, perform there and each day is kind of a test for a beginner because you go up on stage, this is not a recording studio where you get a retake. You go on stage and if you falter then it's happening live in front of people. So there was no nervousness but obviously there was some kind of, uh, I would say, uh, anxiety that, uh, you know, uh, people would expect me to live up to that standard of what my father had said. So all those things you have to go through and you have to fight your own uh, battles in that sense, which I did and it took time. But eventually when I went up on stage, I started enjoying myself from the first, second concerts. And uh, then, then you realize is that very few people in this world get to do what they love, right? I mean, it's not a job where you're uh, being sent to work, uh, which you don't want to go, but you need to kind of uh, somehow manage your, uh, you know, whatever you need to do in life. But this is a, a profession where you don't really have a boss. Uh, you go up there, you play music, people, if, if you're enjoying, people enjoy it. And uh, uh, also, 
you know, it's not like if you don't understand Indian classical music, you won't enjoy it. You can enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is therapeutic also. And today, the world is so small in a sense that you can globally connect to people anywhere in the world. So with the little, uh, with, with one instrument, you can reach out there and uh, do collaborations, uh, do fusion, do electronic genre, uh, play concerts one day in New Zealand, travel to uh, Africa the next day, play in festivals in Venice, in France. So, I mean, it's, it's an amazing experience to be part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, it's what you have told me about just all the, your journey, I mean, starting from 12 to performing at the, this uh, to the international audience also, in a sense, it has been quite a long journey also. The point I was just trying to uh, make or rather understand is that uh, there are a lot of people in there because if you see, I mean, uh, I'm just talking to you about what did Anubhav who does a better kind of a program where he calls the legion in their own self. So people, young kids at the age of three or nine, they accompanied an instrumentalist or the vocalist to the stage and they uh, some of them consider them as a child prodigy in it itself. So, but now you come from a family with your grandfather, Uma Shankarji, your father. Pandit Uma Dutt Sharma. Uh, Pandit Uma yeah. Dutt Sharma, sorry, I mean, my mistake. And Pandit Shiv Kumar Ji. So, did they make it a point that you grind yourself before coming to the stage? No, not at all. Oh, it was not like... Not at all, because uh, first of all, music uh, is something that has to come to you naturally. I'm talking about a musician whose life is music, who goes up on stage and performs. So that is not uh, something that uh, you have to kind of learn like a, uh, there is discipline in it. You have to lead a disciplined life. But just because you're going to a very renowned guru and you think you'll become a musician and you'll go on stage, that doesn't happen. You have to use your inputs, you have to use your observation your inspirations, your uh, experiences all have to reflect in the music and then it grows. So there was no grind as such which they prepared me for. There was nothing like that. It was up to me eventually whether I want to take this uh, as my, you know, as my profession or I want to go further in it. But at the same time having said that the Guru is the one who can spot the potential. So, you need to have the right Guru and if he feels that you are not fit to be on stage, then you better take his advice or you'll suffer later. Yeah. Uh, Rahul, you said that uh, uh, you have to, ha it's such a profession which you love the most, you, where you don't have a boss itself. But classical music, classical music in any sense rather, it's a very sternest exercise to make you a perfect person, a lot of, a lot of grinding takes place. So mo most of our viewers won't be knowing how much efforts one has to put in to come to this stage. So could you please tell our viewers how does your day start and what is the normal practicing hours of you in a daily? Practicing hours. Yeah, practicing hours. Yeah. Uh, well, see, if I'm not traveling, um, my day starts with uh, Riyaz around 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock, whatever. And uh, apart from the Santur, I have a very equal, uh, important family life. Yeah. My wife, Barkha, and my son, Abhinav. So I travel with them sometimes as well. So my day is a mixture of everything. My day is a mixture of my practicing, uh, spending time with my family. At the same time, uh, trying to work on certain elements that are missing, I feel, in my music. And practice is a major aspect that you have to continue all your life. Because uh, although you may feel, you know, practice varies from different, different people. For some people, it takes 10 hours of practice to go up there. And when they, perf when they practice 10 hours, then you can reproduce 50% of that or maybe the full 100%. So it's a very individualistic thing. So for me, music is part of the day. But now that I perform so much, so the practice takes a backseat at times, especially when you're traveling. So all the practice that you've done in your initial years comes in handy when you're traveling so much on tours and performing. So all those things 
uh, are always there. It's like a bank balance which builds up, right? Yeah. And then you just draw from that. So it works like that. Rahul, you have performed with Kenny Rogers, I mean, which is Kenny G. Kenny G. Kenny yeah, G. Sorry, saxophone. and Richard Richard Clareman also. Richard Clareman, yeah. Clareman. So, so I mean, could you please tell our viewers how was your experience? Uh, first, how you did uh, came in contact with them, uh, Richard and Kenny See, G. See, with uh, Richard Clareman, uh, he is the world's highest selling pianist. Uh, sold around 60 million copies or whatever. And uh, I used to listen to his music. In fact, when I was in school, so I was a fan of his. I used to buy his cassettes. And then there was this music company when I was, when I started performing, they approached me that, you know, we have this idea of a collaboration. Those days collaborations were not uh, as rampant as now. It's, it was less. Yeah. Collaborations were not happening so much. So, so it was something new that we thought of that time that the music company, I would like to mention the name of the gentleman, Atul Chiramani, <coughs> who was with uh, Virgin Records. Mm -hmm. So he suggested this combination. And I was like, why not? I mean, I've been listening to this guy's music for a long time. So I not only collaborated, but I composed it for him. I composed the entire album where I had written pieces for him to play. And he was very gracious enough to uh, add his touch to the pieces that I had composed. And it just worked out very well. In fact, it became one of the highest selling instrumental albums, which is still selling, called Confluence. Then we did Confluence 2 which was the second part of it, you know. And then we did concerts together, we shot a music video in Paris. Uh, then, of course, with Kenny G, it was again, uh, he was in India to perform. And uh, Kenny G is a multiple Grammy Award winner and, you know, one of the, I think he's the best known saxophonist in the world. So, I met him over there and he coincidentally heard my music in the hotel that he was staying. So he said, you, you know, when I met him, he said, you're the guy from the CD. I said, yeah, and, you know, so that we just kind of uh, thought that it would be nice to collaborate together. And uh, it just started from musician to musician. There was no music company involved in it. And it just developed into an interesting CD, which was released later by Times Music, and that again did very well. So all these are humbling experiences. At the same time, uh, you, you get to learn <clears throat> uh, about your instrument, you get to learn how it can adapt or how, uh, what you can do for future, what you've not done in this album. And you get to explore facets of your own uh, personality or music, everything, you know, it's an experience. So I would say uh, collaborations definitely have been uh, very interesting for me because I love the Santur in different genres. And I see the potential of that happening, and that's the reason why I try them. Yeah, uh, because uh, you played with Kenny G and this Richard Kellerman, uh, the temperament and the texture of this saxophone and the piano, I could, for personally, I could relate it to the with the santur. Right. Oh, yeah, but you know, the question is that there are some people oh. in the Indian classical scene uh, who assume to be purist, who have some some very strong reservations about the fusion kind of a music. I mean, I don't know whether I subscribe to their viewpoint or not, that's a different take. But what is your take? Same here. If you ask me, I really don't know whether I subscribe to that viewpoint or not. So for me, it doesn't matter. Music is music. And I'm not making music to please critics or uh, the purists. I make music because my fans like it. and. Uh, uh, you know, on my website, so many people have left messages all the time that we love your collaborations. And <clears throat> personally, it gives me great satisfaction. And they have been successful. So, uh, for me, in fact, I would go more steps further. I would even try it, which I did in Electronica, which purists <clears throat> or whoever may not approve of it, but I did it with Deep Forest. I did a collaboration with Deep Forest, again, a Grammy Award yeah. winning group from France. Yeah. And that's hardcore electronica. Okay. And the Santur, I, I took it into that as well. So now I really don't think whether I'm making music for, uh, I, I like to make music which I can uh, hear multiple number of times, you know. So uh, I do it just for that. 
But uh, one thing you can't ignore this fact is that fusion has taken the Indian classical music to the younger generation are the people who didn't don't have much understanding of the Indian classical music. But uh, what is your take on it? Because personally, I feel it has it has transcended certain boundaries and explored certain boundaries also. Yeah, to some extent that is true. But there are other things happening. For instance, we play in a festival in Bangladesh, which is pure Indian classical music. That's an all-night festival. It happens in the army stadium where the cricket match happens. And there are 50,000 people. Yeah, this is what I heard about. I mean, to an Indian 000. classical performance. 50,000 yeah. people come. 50, yeah, this is what I yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, there are all these things happening. We play at WOMAD festivals where there are 5,000 people in New Zealand. They are listening to Indian classical music. So, I think this is uh, an ignorance amongst people uh, that you need to kind of have fusion in it and then it becomes more uh, approachable for the youngster. To a certain extent, I agree with you. But just because that happens doesn't mean every Tom, Dick and Harry has to get into it. And a lot many viewers might not be knowing that Rahul has composed uh, music for the films also. Was some of the films, I mean, Lamhe, Lamhe song, which you composed. I also. was assi assisting my father and uh, Hari Prasad Chaurasia. Yeah. So, Kabhi Mai Kahum was one song which I had composed. Yeah. It was a tune which I, in fact, used in uh, Chandni. Yeah, Chandni, Chandni. Oh, Chandni. Thematic music. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Thematic yeah, music. Thematic, yeah. And Aditya Chopra uh, had really liked that tune. So, he said, let's make this into a song. Yeah. So, in Lamhe, it became a song, Kabhi Mai Kahum, Kabhi Tum Kaho. So, and after that, you composed. After music. that, I did another song uh, as an assistant. I did Sahiba, the title song, which had Sanjay Dutt's Madhuri Dikshit. That I did. And then, uh, yeah, but that was just like an on and off period where I was practicing classical at the same time assisting uh, my father as well. Uh, uh, Rahul, now you belong to our state and Jammu region also. Uh, you're a I mean, face of the Jammu in, in, in itself. Now you have performed throughout the world, throughout the country. You just spoke that uh, 50,000 people were attending classical concert in Bangladesh. That's the highest numbers. Uh, I mean, for, it's the highest number I have heard. I mean, yeah. There was talk about this, the how many people love. But uh, don't you feel, I mean, sometimes a little concerned that the classical scene in Jammu is missing quite a lot? You know, I cannot really. Uh make strong comments on that because I have played for the first time in Jammu. How ironical it is that I come from here, I belong here and I have lived all my life in Mumbai. So, but uh, when I was called here for the 70th uh, year celebrations of the radio, so I performed and uh, it was great. In fact, I played more of folk tunes from Jammu. Um, but I feel that a lot more can happen here. People are hungry for it, but they're not getting enough of that kind of music. So, I just hope that more concerts happen here. Culturally, more grants are given for sp sponsorships for Indian classical music. So that, not just the, the middle-aged or the elderly come, but the younger crowd, the university crowd. I'm sure they're hungry for this music, but they need to, uh, kind of such events need to happen more then I think we will see more of, uh, uh, you know, n fresh faces, fresh crowd coming into for Indian classical music. And Jammu, for some reason, I feel has been uh, a little ignored in that part. I mean, this is the concern was raised by your father, Pandiji itself. I just spoke to you about four, year, four three or four years back, okay. just in front of the governor that we should have more uh, concerts of the classical Indian music here also. But some of the point is that the scene is missing out here. So uh, being a Jammu I mean, I, I don't want to sound parochial in this sense, but yeah, I had a sense of this place. That is why I'm asking, repeating the question again and again. Uh, can the people of Jammu expect from you to play a more active role to bring out this scene here? I would love to be involved in whatever way I can. and. Uh, in fact, I made it a point to come here uh, and break the ice in a way. My wife Barkha and I, we thought that uh, coming to Jammu was a calling which I have to fulfill now. And this was the time, like I said, breaking the ice because it just was not happening for whatever reason it was. 
So, we decided that this time we are going to do it and in fact, even at the cost of leaving some other concerts around that these dates that I had. So, I thought let us you know begin that. So, that process has already begun what you are asking you know. So, Rahul before we wind up this quite a um, interesting conversation with you, could you please hum a line of the, that Lamhe song for our viewers? I mean, what? Well, I will tell you something after Lamhe I did another film called Mujhse Dosti Karoge. Uh, could you please some, uh, yeah, but and could you that please. Was, uh, that was me as music director. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, uh, there was a song which I had composed uh, which Lata Ji sang and it was on screen with Ritik Roshan and Rani Mukherjee. So, uh, the song was Jaane Dil Mein Kab Se Hai Tu. So, I don't really remember the lyrics but I will start with the tune. <clears throat> da ra 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 da ra 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 la 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 da ra 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 jaane dil mein kab se hai tu jab se main hu tab se hai tu तुझको मेरे रब की कसम यार रब से पहले है तू थैंक्स अ लॉट राहुल थैंक्स फॉर स्पेंडिंग योर टाइम फॉर द एक्सेल्शन न्यूज़ एंड व्यूज दैट इज फॉर टुडे इटसेल्फ